So, oh, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so I hope as one, yeah, I can hear myself. So it's working the microphone. All right, so <clears throat> we need to finish um, for the modeling of cancer evolution. And I see that, I see that this morning you did, uh, you did some some of the you know uh, modeling of the evolution of the cancer and uh, using sequencing data. So that's good. MRCA, that's good. So Julio, show you some of of that. Uh, <clears throat> so I was going over or I started going over something that we just published, um, where uh, as, uh, Widow Maria and, and Sophie, Sophie first author, she's sitting in the room. And uh, uh, I think I described the basic idea of uh, modeling every time you get hit by a driver mutation. Uh, you know, the idea in the model is to consider a stochastic phase until when you hit a, a size epsilon C, where C is the carrying capacity, okay? So there is some epsilon C, uh, some threshold, where if you get to at least that size, then you know that the probability of survival of the clone is extremely high. And so then you can start using deterministic, basically you can model the rest of the growth in a deterministic way for simplicity. So stochastic for the first phase, deterministic once it goes over epsilon C, uh, the deterministic phase has a logistic growth. Uh, the stochastic one is inverted that process. Okay, and as I said, I, I don't want to do you know epsilon deltas today. It's uh, I think this is mainly to give to give you a flavor of of what you can do and how the models are. So um, and I talked to you about the. Uh, three different types of driver mutations with three different effects affecting cell division um, and uh, mutation rates. And so let me just give you a little bit more detail. Again, the purpose is just to, to give you a sense of, of uh, you know, of the modeling. Um, and so if you, if you consider the uh, you know, occurrence of cancer, uh, we can assume that there is a number N of required driver mutations, okay? That you have to hit, uh, that you have to acquire in order to get to cancer. I told you typically this number is between one and four. Uh, often for solid tumors is three and uh, for liquid tumors is two. And now um, um, we consider, you know, th this requirement. So you need to get in a, in a, in a cancer, you need to get this uh, clones, um, we call surviving clones, uh, where for surviving would mean hitting the epsilon C size. They, um, you know, have, um, where, where the clone is made out of cells that contain a mutation, a driver mutation that belongs to one of these three types, S, F, or M, where these are the three types I just, I showed you, right? So it's either affecting cell survival or cell fate or increasing the mutation rate, so genome maintenance. And when you look at the timeline from conception, right, then your birth, and then at some point uh, you get this surviving clone, sometime s and then you look at all the way to time t and you ask what is the probability uh that at the at time uh, you know the, the time at which you get to cancer which is the time at which you have all the required driver mutations so the time where you have all this multiple hit has occurred and hits you know what is probability that that happens uh, by time lowercase t, so by some time t, all right? So t sub n is the time of cancer, t lowercase t is just 
time. And so uh, you can show <clears throat> that that can be expressed mathematically when you go through just the differential, you know, writing the, the expression for it. Uh, I can write it if you want to. Um, you know, it becomes one minor the exponential of, of, of this integral, which I think it makes sense if you have seen any type of stochastic modeling or you think about, uh, yeah, any exponentially distributed uh, type of event, this would be the rate. But here, instead of just a simple constant rate, we have an integral, okay? Where uh, what, what the key part of it is this lambda function, okay? So, and what is, what is the lambda? Where the lambda function, so lambda is lambda of S, S is the time at which the, you, have, you get the surviving clone. Um, okay, so <clears throat> you need two things. Two, there are two parts, really key parts in this pressure. One is the rate at which these surviving clones appear. So we, we call this mu, all right? So mu of u1 at s means that at s you got a, a, a clone v1 appeared. Um, v1 here can be a clone of any of these three types, okay, of these three key driver mutation types. Then once you get it, that's not enough, of course, to get to cancer, right? You just got a surviving clone, but we said that you need uh, three driver mutations, for example, to get to cancer. So N, you know, whatever that N is. So N here is three. I mean, if, if you want, you can think of N as equal to three. So once you have the surviving clone, the next thing that you need is that that clone that now we know is going to survive needs to acquire the other mutations. So given that that clone appear, what is the probability that that clone will acquire all those extra mutations in time? Well, how much time you have left? If you want to look at the probability to get cancer by time t, the time that is left is if the clone survives, surviving clone appears at time s, you have t minus s, right, as the time left for this clone to become cancer, to acquire all the rest of, you know, all the required ingredients to get to cancer. So that's expressed by this part of the formula, right? And now you consider the summation of all the possible clones across, you know, that's why you have a sum of all the real ones where the requirement is that, um, you know, these clones are representing are created by mutations that are either S, F, or M type, okay? So it's actually pretty simple, I would say. Um, and, and so just to give you a little bit more detail of, let, let's focus one second on this appearance rate for a clone. Okay, so how does a clone appear? A surviving one. What, what is you know what is the rate of that? Um, well, okay. First of all, and and here you have all the you know. Uh, sorry, the for some reason when we transfer slides, the colors got a little bit messed up, but it's okay. Uh, but uh, so first of all, you need to get a mutation, and the mutation appears with. Uh, it, it's a, you know, the appearance of a mutation, it's a function of the population size at that time. So that's X, okay? So the number of cells basically, right? Then B is the division rate, okay? So it's a function of how many cells you have, how often they divide, right? And then for every division, what is the probability that you get the mutation at that division? So this is the probability of a mutation per cell division of that particular mutation if you're modeling a, a particular mutation type, okay? And then here is a two minus P. Uh, that is simply because <clears throat> that comes from the fact uh, that if you have this type of division, Okay, do you see what is the form? The, so your probability of a mutation, you get two cells, right? So this is what you get there. 
but if you get this type of division, only one of the cells of the daughter cells are going to be important to us, right? So to keep track. So here you get two, here you get one. When you put these two together, if you do just the you know, just the arithmetic, you get this two, uh, one minus P B. Okay. Oh, sorry, two minus P. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's that part. And then, and then as you can see, uh, if if you get hit by mutation, which mutation type is it? Well, there are, this is what pi is, is there for, okay? So you have, as I said, you have three types, uh, S, F, and, and uh, M, okay? So now, now that we have, say, a particular mutation type has hit the cell, now you look at the probability uh, this row is for the probability that this clone will survive, will reach size epsilon c, okay? And then this is the time that, because you see there is a z here, this is the population size at time c, at time z, which is before s, right? That's where the mutation occurs in this figure. And so then there is this lat latency time period, right? from S to Z, which is the time it takes for the mutation to create a clone that reaches survive, surviving size, okay? So that's the, just the explanation of these terms. Now you integrate from, you know, conception basically all the way to S, that tells you what is the lambda S. This is just the basic intuition. It's actually a bit more complicated when you really look at the details of that, but okay. And so, so that gives us, when you substitute now, when you plug in your lambda function into the expression here, you get the probability, you know, your PV1. Uh, uh, well, sorry, uh, this part is actually, um, yeah, sorry, I, for, I forgot. I, I need to mention this part. This part is, uh, as you remember, once you get a surviving clone, what is the probability that once you, that surviving clone has appeared, that that clone, from that clone, you will get a cancer before time t, right? That's this piece, okay. And, um, and what is that probability? Well, basically is, you know, same idea. It's this one minus the exponential function where the rates are given by this integral where now you consider there is a V1, you need to get a V2, okay, and, and so on, right? So that's the, that's the intuition. And so, right, as, as we wrote here, uh, the various PV1, PV1, V2, PV1, V2, V3 are calculated this way. You end up with a full formula, depending on how many, you know, if you're, if you're modeling blood cancer, then you can stop at two, say, solid tumor, maybe you need to go all the way to three and so on. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Sure. Uh, does this uh, probability value depend on time? Yes, it does. Yeah. And in fact, it's hidden. Uh, yeah. If you really want the details of those formulas, you really have to look at the supplementary of the paper. Here, I'm just trying to give, a, and it's, in fact, it's a bit complicated to just show the, a formula that makes sense without a ton of notation. But um, yeah, so some dependencies in the, in the expression that are hidden. Okay, so, so once you have the probability of, uh, you know, getting to cancer by time t is one minus this e to the minus, you know, capital lambda. Um, and what we show in, in that paper is that under some simplifying assumptions, it reduces to this expression, okay? Um, and, and in fact, uh, uh, well, let's go through the terms. So N is the number of stem cells. Okay, makes sense. The more the cells, number of cells, you know, the higher this probability. U here is the driver mutation probability. Okay, to the N, which is the number of required drivers. 
And then you get this expression where B naught is the proliferation rate before birth, okay, with some Taylor terms here, plus the proliferation rate after birth, which is B. This actually makes a lot of sense, right? If I think about it, think about independent, complete independent events. Um, then it would just be, tell me how many cells you have. So uh, actually, let me, let me do this. Forget before birth. Let's simplify. Let's eliminate that. Well, if you eliminate that, you get that this lambda becomes this, right? We just drop this term. So this actually makes a lot of sense because up to some constant, it's hiding some mess. Uh, we have what? How many cells you have? What is the mutation probability per division? And then you're just counting how many divisions you have, which is this is the division rate and this is the time, right? So B2T tells you how many divisions you have, right? And if you need N of those events, you, you get, uh, so I, I think it's actually pretty intuitive. Um, so under this simplifying assumption and where we drop, the possibility that that the this uh, clones are created before birth, which you may not want to drop. In fact, uh, we are working on this development phase. There are some interesting observations there too. But um, you, if if you use this lambda here in this formula, that actually that's a variable distribution. Okay. And what is neat about this is that the variable I will depending on how you pronounce it. Uh, it's a distribution that's been used a lot in modeling cancer incidents by statisticians. It's a distribution that makes sense. You know, it's uh, modeling failure times. So we've seen cancer as a failure time. But there was never a justification for using a variable distribution, except for saying, yeah, I mean, it, cancer must be some type of failure, right? But here we are actually showing that mechanistically, when you model, all the events that you need, right? These multiple sequential events that you need to get to cancer, you end up that you can approximate all that complicated process by the variable. Okay, so I think now as a decision saying, I'm going to use the variable distribution for modeling time to cancer, there is a, um, I, I would say, much more solid justification for that. Okay, so, wait a second, okay. So, you know, when uh, just to show you some uh, plots of how these uh, expressions work in different tissues, uh, we have uh, here you see breast, colon, and lung. Um, by the way, this is assuming no exposures. Okay, so as you can see, uh, <clears throat> the Number of cells, division rates uh, have uh, obviously have important effects on when you, you know, how the, the cumulative uh, uh, risk of cancer uh, behaves. Uh, this is cut at 80, right? That's uh, a reviewer asked us, but what, you know, what if we didn't have the current lifespan? And so here you see the density of this time to cancer, right? So this kind of shows you that in theory, if we could live, you know, I don't know, 500 years, uh, each one of us, even without exposures, and if our body keeps going the same way, each one of us would have every cancer in every organ, right? It's just a matter of time, basically, you know, the density uh, as, as expected. Okay. Um, Oh yeah. Now, an important other, another important consequence of uh, from this work is that so <clears throat> when you look at the viable distribution, right? This is the probability. Okay, so it's just the viable ones. So, uh, now, if you just look at if you do Taylor approximation, look at the first term, right? What you get here is this thing becomes one minus all of this exponent, so the two ones cancel. And you're left with that, right? So lifetime cancer risk can be approximated by this expression. Okay, where 
all I did here at, uh, from what was here, you know, I'm using the fact that, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm you know, age here is A before we have time, keep changing some of the uh, symbols on you. But um, uh, here, what I'm doing is I'm taking B and A together, okay? Or T as lifetime and considering a, and, and calling it D, okay? For the number of divisions. So as you can see, there is a kappa constant and then U and D to the N and then the number of stem cells. Okay, and so what is, what is interesting about that is, if you remember, I told you on the first day that, and that knowing that was wrong, what I did here when, when I looked at different tissues and the relationship between how many life, not, lifetime number of, of cell divisions and therefore of these mutations, accumulating different organs, I was looking at essentially the product of the number of cells and the number of divisions in the lifetime of that tissue for each one of those cells. And that's that product, okay? So yeah. how did you estimate K cup I think it plays a important role in the global tissue. Yes, that's uh, that's a question for after for afterwards. Yeah, we can talk about that because yeah, it's it's uh, it's not so. Okay, so that's uh, that's the basic idea, right? It was to say, well, how many mutations are accumulated in a tissue is going to be proportional to how many cells I have times how many times each one of those cells has divided. But actually. What I just showed you is that the, the correct, more correct formula is to say that the probability is a function of, you remember the Bible, right? The function of UD to the N and the number of cells. So now, what does this mean? This is very important, okay? So if you've been following, this is critical. The probability of cancer, it's linear with respect to the number of cells, okay? But as a power law relationship with respect to U times D. Okay, what does that mean? That means that it's actually very intuitive. If I have a tissue that, say for example, if my brother has um, double size of a given organ. So this is times two, right? The risk in terms of number of mutations, in terms of the risk I'm modeling should be about double approximately, okay? because there are double cells creating those events and those mutations that may take a person to cancer, okay? So it's linear, the formula, the expression, it's linear in N, but it's not linear in terms of how many divisions I have. So a tissue that has a double number of divisions does not risk double cancer. There is more than that. It, it, it risks more than that. Right, because of this, uh, you know, power law relationship, and we see this in the cancer incidence curves. So like when you look at them, right, there is this kind of like this exponentially shaped curve. Um, it's not linear with age. The older we get, that you know, uh, exponentially more we risk in terms of cancer. And so, <clears throat> so that allows us in this new study to take the same points I showed you before, but now <clears throat> uh, instead of a you know, 2D, now we do a 3D plot where we split D and N. Before they were just multiplied together and considered together. Here, because we recognize that in one direction, it's a linear effect in the other direction is not. Uh, we, we split them along the two axes, okay? And so now each point here, which is a tissue, has the number of cells as one of the <clears throat> variables, as one of the coordinates, and the other coordinate, uh, say the y coordinate, is the number of divisions to the power of n. Okay, and the mutation rate. This is a constant across all tissues, right? So, is that clear? And so what happens? <clears throat> what happens here is that uh, let's see if. Um, is, is, Sophie, this is the video, right? Okay, let me see. Okay, yes. So 
as you can see, it got a lot better in terms of fit. Okay. And uh, so in terms of comparison, we went from an adjusted R square, which was about two thirds, if you remember, because the correlation was 0 0.8. So then it was about uh, two thirds to something that it's now 0 0.8. Okay. <laughs> so to conclude uh, this part, I just let me say that. Uh, I think I think one of the important roles that the machine learners modelers can have in uh, whether it's cancer or anything really in biology is to um, to do the following. And I have this figure. This is taken from a book. Um, uh, I think it's uh, to the Sirani book. Uh, yeah, Hesty, Hesty, and you know this is the Stanford group of statisticians. Uh, it's a very famous group on machine learning. Uh, but the idea is that so if the truth is here, right, and then there is some noise, so the realization could be somewhere around the truth. What you actually observe, because there is always randomness. Say just the model space. So what we can get, how close we can get to the truth to our models is represented by this red line, right? But then we often try to restrict the model space. We focus how to, uh, you know, reduce the dimension of it and optimize how close we are to the, uh, to the truth in this way. But one thing I feel that uh, people in machine learning, people in quantitative science should focus a bit more on is that the model space, you know, a lot of the work can be on, the, it should be on the model space and how we can get it closer. So how we can get this red line closer to the truth, okay? There is a lot of work on, on, the, on the Parco line. Okay. And, um, and so, I think I split it here in, in one setting. And sorry, I know I'm going very fast, but if you're familiar with some machine learning, they, this will sound very familiar. You know, for example, if you look at the square error loss, okay, you can break that down. And I refer you to the book if you haven't seen this. This is actually a, a very, very good thing. I think, I think I've seen something the other day along these lines that you were doing in class, so you should know. But if I look at the square error loss, you can break that down in a reducible error Okay, there is nothing you can do about that. And then the model bias, okay? And then the estimation bias and plus, you know, the variance. So, <clears throat> you know, there is always variance everywhere and there is estimation bias and, and so on. So my point is that there is a lot of work on this estimation bias. I feel there is not enough work on the model bias. Okay, but if you really want to understand a phenomena, I think the model bias is really the most important one that you have to reduce. And I feel in, in the example I just gave you that that's, that's what we did in that case, right? We, we provided a better model for then analyzing the data that you get and understanding, you know, the cost, I mean, in making inference out of that data. You see, I think that is more important than once I have that data, you know, what is the best um, methodology to fit those points, you know, given a model? Well, no, I think the most important thing is what model I'm going to, what model of reality I'm going to use. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Just to conclude this part, you can also use um, you know, this approach to understand how many mutations an individual patient should have. And so at a given age A, imagine on this line, right? You have, a, a, for if a patient got hit by cancer by age A, that means that if say there were three required drivers together, 
there was a T1, T2, and T3, okay? And the birth, the division rate was B, the normal division rate until the first driver. And then because of that driver, it, it gets, it changes. And so now it's B1 and then another driver hits. And so there is again, another fitness advantage, right? And so when you want to calculate how many mutations, if you assume that every time you have a division, there is some mutation rate, right? There is a probability of getting some mutations. Then what you can do is you can say, well, by age A, how many mutations I expect? Well, it's the mutation probability for times the number of divisions that happen before birth, the ones that happen until time T1, where the division rate was B, the one that happened between T2 and T1 with the new division rate because of the thinnest advantage caused by the first driver and so on, okay? And now you can compare this to sequencing data. I'll skip this part because just because of time, but, and so here again in the same paper, what we showed is that just, you know, this is without seeing the data. This is just using, uh, I mean, we are seeing the data. Obviously, we then see, you know, we see the data too, but just using standard uh, est par parameters, uh, estimate uh, coming from the literature, we could fit, I would say, you know, the average number of mutation by a given age in breast um, pretty well, I would say, right? Uh, maybe not so in lung for a very simple reason, because lung, we here are modeling just the normal accumulation of mutations. But when you look at, at lung cancer patients, a lot of the effect there is due to smoking, which we are not included in our prediction, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we look at uh, a bit more complicated figure where here, every color, it's a different cancer type and every dot it's one patient, okay? And here, what I'm showing you is the x-axis coordinate is what the number of mutations that we would expect just due to R, to these normal endogenous processes. And on the y-axis is how many we actually observe in the patient through sequencing. So of course, there is a lot of variation, but as you can see on this line, which is the line where expect and observe match, okay? A lot of the tissues are, you know, we, we are in the right ballpark, I would say, okay? There are two major exceptions, the yellow and the light blue tissues. But guess what those are? One is lung cancer, the yellow one, which is so smoking really takes those tissue and adds a lot of mutation to them. And the other one is melanoma skin cancer, where again, we know the sun exposure has a very powerful environmental if you want, effect on the tissue, okay? And so I always like to say, you know, sometimes I'm asked, how do you know that there is no something very powerful that we are drinking the water that we just don't know of, or, you know, some, something like smoking to the level of smoking or, or sun exposure at the general population level? My answer, given this figure, is I actually don't think that that is possible. The reason being that if there was, um, at the, again, at the population level, I cannot exclude in a few people, right, in a, a small subset of selected patients. But in general, <laughs> if there was, I would see a tissue or some tissues being big outliers. My, my point is, you know, it took maybe 50 years to really prove that smoking causes cancer. It, it was actually a very big endeavor of, you know, in, in the epidemiological field to really prove it. Um, let's say we, we didn't have any of that. Um, just by looking at how many mutations you expect in a tissue normally and how many you find in those cancers, Anyone just looking at this figure would have said there is something wrong going on in lung and skin. Okay. And the reason is that because our DNA doesn't care about what we know, what we don't know. Our DNA is recording everything, right? 
So even if we have not done yet the research to show that smoking is causing lung cancer, our DNA is recording that effect. And so the point here is that if there were really major effects that, that we still don't know of, we will see it recorded in the DNA. And we will see some major deviation from the expected values. Is that clear? Does it make sense? Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to... Oh, and, and here is... So here is the unadjust. And then if we try to... And it's still... I, I think it's because of the estimations are still not good. But if we try to adjust for what is the effect of, uh, oops, the effect of smoking and lung cancer uh, and uh, sun exposure and skin cancer, then from this figure... You know, now we are adding the mutations that smoking adds and sun exposure adds, then the plot becomes better. Now we are including the effect of the environment. And as I said, I think we are just not including it properly. I think the, the current estimates on what, how much the sun affects the skin, in, in based on this analysis at least, I would say are still, uh, you know, undershooting the true values. Okay, uh, so that was what I should have done by yesterday. So today we can start with, we can go uh, and talk about our last topic, which is <clears throat> on liquid biopsies and, and for the early detection of cancer. So let me, let me just say that this is a very <clears throat> important <clears throat> topic and uh, I would recommend that you, well, I, I want you to be aware of that at least because it's really, um, uh, it's really a critical field today in cancer research and it holds a lot of promise. And the, the idea um, in terms of motivation for why this is so important is the following. Um, well, actually, let me let me first before you mention this slide. Let me ask you a question. So, have you ever? Uh, you probably are, have heard that you know in the United States, uh, President Nixon uh, declared war on cancer. Okay, have you have you? I don't know if you ever heard this, but uh, that was in 1971. So basically, it's been 50, 50 years. Uh, <clears throat> do you have a sense of how much? cancer mortality has been reduced in this 50 years. So in this war, during this war on cancer. And by the way, you know, what that meant, declaring war on cancer wasn't just saying we declare you war on cancer, it was bringing a lot of funding to research to help with, uh, you know, solving this problem. Do you know this 50 years of research, what, what was the yield? What has been the yield? Just uh, in terms of, let's say, cancer mortality reduction. Give me a proportion. By how much do you think we reduce cancer mortality in 50 years? Any guess is good. I'm just, I want to see what you would think. Yes, that's, that's a good point. Overall, just give me a sense, you know, do you think we did pretty well or? Right. Yeah, that, that's, it's a very good comment, yeah. So I'll give you a number, <clears throat> it's 20%, okay? So we reduce mortality by 20%. By the way, that's a proportion. If we're looking at absolute numbers, we actually have more cancer today than we had 50 years ago. So if you look at the absolute number of deaths, we actually have more, okay? That's how we are doing. And I would claim <clears throat> that one major reason of that is due to the fact that cancer research has focused until today mainly on therapy, okay? And so we end up trying to treat late stage. So high cost, late stage, that's the paradigm today. And, and I think it's, it's been failing, obviously. 
uh, to give you a comparison uh, in 30 years, um, heart um, disease, mortality from heart has gone down by 50% in 30 years. And I think one of the major reasons is that there, of course, we want to understand how to do treatment and therapy better, but the focus has been, there has been a major focus on prevention, okay? So, you know, checking cholesterol levels and all those, all type of screening. Okay, so how do you prevention for cancer? Well, there are two ways. Um, we call them, it's, I mean, this is an epidemiological, you know, definition. Uh, primary prevention, since it's prevention from cancer mortality, primary prevention is you uh, stop the exposure, okay? You avoid the exposure. So primary prevention would be, for example, spending money to convince the population that smoking is bad, right? So you print on cigarette packs that um, some scary messages and uh, things like that, right? Okay, primary prevention, when it works, is great because you stop the disease from occurring. There are two problems, though. One is, so there are two limitations. It's great and it remains a great thing to do and we need to do primary prevention. But there are two big limitations. One is that some people, no matter how much you tell them that they shouldn't do something, they will still do it, okay? So it's not going to work if, if you don't actually apply uh, that policy. Uh, the second, even more important, I would say, is that Remember the table I show you, the Harvard, you know, if you do these things, basically this is all that causes cancer. Well, by now, I hope I at least somewhat convince you that there is a lot of cancer that has nothing to do with external exposures or lifestyles. And so as of today, we just cannot do primary preventions for those cancers in general. Okay, I, I have an exception, an example of an exception, but I can tell you later if you are interested. But in general, for the cancer that's just occurring normally because of our body accumulating divisions, you know, unless you stop living, those things will keep happening and, and we'll, we'll get to cancer. As, as we just saw, if we ling, live long enough, we will all get to cancer in all of our organs. So how do you do, what do you do for that part? Well, uh, the, the other component of prevention is called secondary prevention. And secondary prevention is... Um, Essentially, you cannot prevent cancer from occurring, but you can prevent cancer from killing the patient. Okay, so another way, uh, the typical way to define cancer, secondary prevention is early detection. Okay, so if you can detect the cancer early, then you can remove it surgically when you are still the, the cancer is still localized. Okay, and that can have a major impact. So. As a motivation, here is, uh, you know, uh, two examples. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this is, the, this is the big killer for women uh, and for men, the two, right? Uh, together with lung cancer, these are the three big cancer types. Uh, <clears throat> and as you can see, if I find cancer in stage one or two, when the cancer is still localized, after five years, uh, essentially 99% of women are alive. So that means that the cancer was found, was removed surgically and done, okay? Or with the radiation or whatever, but done. Similarly with prostate cancer, 100% of those that found the cancer at the localized stage are fine after five years, okay? Essentially all of them. Now look instead when you find cancer in stage four. For breast cancer, three out of four women, five years later are dead, okay? And for prostate cancer, it's uh, basically 70% 70, 70 of them are. And so <clears throat> this provides the motivation for, especially for that part of cancer that you cannot prevent with primary prevention, you have to detect it early. And in fact, even for those that you can do primary prevention, you still want to detect them as early as you can, right? So that's why these this, uh, met new methodologies are, are becoming so important in the field 
because they really hold the promise to finally change the outlook of cancer, which is, as you all know, it's just terrible, right? Um, okay, so uh, this is a paper we published in 2018 and was the first paper to publish a, a method for uh, multi-cancer uh, early detection using a blood test that analyzed uh, both mutations and proteins, okay? And um, uh, a group at Hopkins of uh, cancer researchers, um, uh, Dr. Vogelstein, uh, um, probably the leader among them, without the probably being the leader among them. Um, and uh, on my side, I was I was uh, developing the you know the algorithmic side. Uh, so I was responsible for that. So it was like, you know, a five out, five last out or corresponding outers, depending on which part we were responsible for. But so we published this paper and uh, we show that uh, uh, these technologies uh, hold a lot of promise. And I'll tell you now in a second, this is just a case control study, but things are moving forward. And uh, uh, so <clears throat> in this case, um, so, uh, and maybe let me, uh, did anyone talk about cell-free, because I don't want to repeat things, but did anyone talk about cell-free DNA at all before me today? Okay. So what we know today is that when you have cancer, typically the cancer will shed some of its DNA in the blood. Okay. Uh, the reason is that, you know, even in cancer, you have a lot of cell death. And when cells die, you know, things break down and, and DNA enters in the bloodstream. And so now it's typically a small signal, but you can find fragments of DNA that are not normal, that contain mutations, right? And the protein, some protein levels also change when you have cancer. So if you can sample just a simple blood test, right? And then you measure, uh, we call it cell-free DNA for just when we talk about this DNA floating in the blood, but in the cell free, among the cell free DNA, there is the circulating tumor DNA. Basically, the fragments of DNA, they are coming from the tumor. And so that's CT DNA. So by looking at the M proteins, we, through some you know, um, methodology, we could classify uh, patients or people, whether they were healthy or not, whether they had cancer or not. Okay, and uh, so let me uh, let me just first say that this doesn't have to be necessarily blood. We did uh, this uh, for endometrial and ovarian cancer with pap um, you know, using urine as a liquid for urotelial and bladder cancer. Um, and um, you can use these technologies also for detecting recurrence of cancer. So instead of finding it early in patients that don't know they have it, you can also use these technologies for patients that had cancer, had surgery, and now they wonder, is some cancer still there? Is cancer coming back? And again, by checking the blood, you can test that, right? So let me, let me um, talk one second about the first one. I'll talk about the first one a second and I mean a little bit and then the last one. Um, so the first one, which was called cancer seek, as I told you, was measuring circulating tumor DNA and protein levels. And uh, um, uh, it was a pretty large case control study, uh, you know, about a thousand patients and 800 controls. Uh, across different cancer type and also across different stages, okay? And um, I, I want to go through how we thought about this because again, to me, this, you know, whether it's the model or the feature engineering, those are the most important part, even from a machine learning perspective, okay? Then the final, I'll show you in a second. I use logistic regression here as the classifier. Okay, so nothing too fancy. Um, and of course, you can improve a little bit by doing something super sophisticated, which we did later. And the improvement was very little, but really where the major improvements are is 
in this part. And that's why I'm showing you this. So <clears throat> the first question is, okay, let's say we want to look at mutations that are typical in cancer. How would you pick which mutations to look at? Okay. And here is, here is what we did. There is this uh, database, which is the TCGA, which is the Cancer Genome uh, Atlas. And, uh, and so it's sequencing data from many cancer types. And we said, okay, let's look at the mutation this the most common among all cancers. Because we definitely would like to find that one. If we are trying to have a multi-cancer test, we better find that one, right? Okay, so that's the... So we look at the, all the sequencing data, you know, 30,000 uh, patients. And we just ask which one is the top mutation in terms of frequency. So very simple. And then we say, okay, what about the second? And what about the third? So we rank them, okay? And then for every tissue and also all of them together, we ask, okay, how many, so starting with, uh, on the X axis here, I have those mutations ranked. And, you know, when, when the value here is one, that means that I'm only picking the top mutation in the ranking. And I look at what is the proportion of patients in the TCG data set that would be caught if I had this perfect technology that if the mutation is present in that patient, I'm assuming I would detect it. Okay, so this is an ideal scenario. This is a completely theoretical scenario because in many cases, even if the patient had as, has the mutation, I may not be able to catch it in the blood, okay? But from a theoretic perspective, you know, basically this is an upper bound of how well we can do is to say, well, how many of the patients in TCJ had the mutation? Now you have to understand that in the data that we use, TCGA, these are sequencing data of cancer. So you literally take a sample of the cancer itself, you sequence and you look at the mutations. And because the mutations are going through this clonal you know, expansions, they are say subclonally present there. So it's somewhat easy to find them. Instead then we will have the task to find the, them in the blood if some of the DNA of the tumor is shed in the blood. Much harder task, right? But let's pretend we have a perfect technology. If the patient has the mutation of cancer, we are going to find in the blood. How many would we find based on TCGA? And this is the curve that's represented here, okay? For every tissue. And so what you can see is that, um, you know, with, with about 60, with about 60, well, we ended up choosing 61, but at around 60 <clears throat> amplicons, amplicons are just small regions of DNA, okay? Uh, like an interval. Um, <clears throat> so we just essentially, when, once we got to this particular 60 positions, this 60 little intervals on the gen genome, we were observing the curves, you know, flattening. And since you have to think about sequencing cost, because, you know, ideally, if you don't have any issue of cost, right, this is an optimization problem, right? If you don't have any issue of cost, you will sequence all mutations, you will just do across the whole genome. But if you want to try to save in terms of cost, then what we observe is that actually with a very small number of positions, I mean, look at that, it's only 2,000 bases total, we were catching almost, if we had an ideal technology that could catch everything, you know, we were reaching pretty much the upper bound of what you could find. So that's how we decided to, you know, to, to get this, about this, uh, uh, in, in, you know, the 61, I actually don't remember exactly why 61, but the point is, from a machine learning perspective, at around 60, we, there, were, there were no really major advantages in increasing the number, okay? Specific regions, right? So that, the, the way that we're selected is what I was saying before, which is start with the most common mutation. And that's your first one. That is in one region, right? 
and you know if it happens that two mutations are very close to each other they may happen to be in the same little region so you capture them together right okay is this clear so this is how we decided which one to put into the into the you know the method the, the algorithm yes Please. I, I mean before metastasis. If it's metastasis, kind of too late. You know, once the, once, the can, once the cancer has metastasized and it's multiple places, in general, you're not going to catch up. Um, yeah. So in the TCGA data set, I have no blood samples. I actually have uh, the results of, of sequencing the actual cancer of about 30,000 patients, okay? So I can say, for example, take a, a TP53 particular mutation, okay? Let's say that's the most common. Now you say, how many patients in colorectal cancer have that mutation. So I go to TCJ, I look at the sequencing data of the tumors and I see what is the proportion of them that have that one. And then, and then I go to the second most common. And then I say, now if I do, I've considered the first and the second together, how many patients would I catch in the TCJ data set? But again, this is by looking at the sequencing of the tumor. Of course, it's so it's an upper bound because, of course, once our technology then goes in looking at blood, which is a very indirect way, right? But this is we want to do early detection. We we don't have a, a cancer to sequence. If we if we have a cancer, then we already know that there is a cancer, right? Is that is that clear? Yes. Uh, would it make sense to make specific tests maybe for the most common cancers or would they have a similar result as this one? So it cost-wise, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, so two, two parts uh, of, of, you know, uh, two, two answers. The first one is, as you can see here, for some reason that we actually didn't expect initially, this number, you know, here is the, the point is 60 or 61, right? As you can see, this flattening happens to be with this particular combination of mutations happens to catch pretty much what you can catch across uh, different cancer types, okay? It didn't have to be like this, by the way, right? It didn't have to be like this. It could have been that in some cancer, you catch a lot in some with the same 60, you catch very little. It could be that every cancer has their own, and so there is no overlap whatsoever among them, okay? So I would say the fact that with 60, you are able to get to where each of the curves of different cancer types get flat, you know, flattened down, indicates that there is some major advantage of looking at it altogether. Uh, the second part of that uh, uh, of the of the uh, of my answer is, um, but you are exactly right. You want to ask the question because, for example, in breast cancer, there are already screening methodologies, right? And and different cancer types have different incidence. So, um, the value of catching a cancer that's very rare may not be as important as catching something that's quite common. But if you have already a lot of methodologies out there for catching that common cancer, then maybe the multi-cancer test is not really adding much to what it's already there. You may be better to improve just on detecting, say, breast cancer specifically, since that one is very common, or lung cancer specifically. And so that question becomes also an economics question. And uh, we, uh, I have a paper I'll, I'll show, I believe it's at the end of my slides, so I'll refer you to it, um, or, or I can give it to you later, uh, the reference, but 
uh, where we did a cost benefit analysis and where we show um, or give a sense of when it's convenient to have a multi cancer versus when it's not. Okay, because again, every cancer has its own situation with screening methodologies available for some. Some are very good, some are not good. Some cancers have no screening methodologies and so on. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, so here you're taking uh, the TCGA data set. So those are all uh, samples with like tumor samples. So we are not here looking into normal samples which might share these mutations. And like last class, we were talking about some mut driver mutations appear as early as 15 years before the onset of symptoms. So I'm just thinking of the practical implications of an early detection test. So if, uh, say, someone finds a driver mutation from their cell-free DNA, but they do not, uh, the like the cells carrying the mutation have not yet reached a point where we can call it a cancer. And so it's like, you know, you're you might get cancer, but you might not. And then it's like an indefinite wait till you get cancer. So, so um, you, you should work with us if you are interested, because you just mentioned maybe one of the most fundamental problems. And, and that's exactly what I'm going to show you next, which is, okay, fine, these are cancers, but how do we distinguish cancer from normal? Where no, what we mean for normal is, not really normal, there are driver mutations, just not full cancer. But actually, if you remember what I showed you in the first class, I had one slide where it said, you know, the new normal. Like what we currently know, thanks to many's research, also mine, is that actually we are full of these mutations normally. So that is normal. So how, how normal is normal and when it becomes cancer, that's exactly the task of this early detection methodologies to, to distinguish, to separate the two cases. And that's, that's it, that's the challenge. And so I'll, I'll show you what we did. So, you know, what you can do uh, when you take the DNA of a person, you can uh, attach unique identifiers to each molecules that we call them UIDs. Yeah, sorry. Oh, please, I'm happy to answer now then, yeah. Um, where is the chat? I don't know, is it here? Chat. Are these genes generally, 16 genes generally connected to cancer? Yes, absolutely. So that's a great question. Oh, you see the chat here too. Let me, let me just uh, put a light here on the side. Uh, and this way I see if someone asked a question. <clears throat> yeah, so great question. The yes, when you look at the list, you can refer to the I'll refer you to the paper. It's a 2018 paper. When you look at the list of the 16 genes, are exactly you know the most common uh, cancer, you know, gene mutated, most common mutated genes. Yes. So the answer is yes, absolutely. Um that's, that's exactly why we were looking at, at them uh, based on their frequencies. So, okay, so now imagine you take this blood sample of someone and from that blood, you extract DNA. And now in each for each fragment of DNA that you find, there is this, you know, this technology that allows you to attach labels basically to every fragment. We call those labels UIDs, okay? It's what here in the symbol is. So if the fragment is this orange piece in this figure, you know, this uh, preceding piece, which is red, green, purple, or blue, are these various labels, unique identifiers. That's what UID means. So they get attached. Why do we do that? Well, we want to kind of keep track of every fragment as its own thing, right? To separate them. And then we amplify them. And amplifying them means that, uh, are you I'm sure you're familiar with PCR. If you're coming from system biology, you've heard about PCR. So I won't explain it, but you know, basically you get a lot of copies. <clears throat> and now, um, 
Oh, yeah, I forgot I even had the slide for PCR, if you don't remember. But so now you, for each, so for basically you end up at the end of the process that instead of having just one copy of that fragment, now you have multiple, multiple copies of the same fragment, right? And, and now there is a bunch, for example, this one is a fragment with a bad mutation, say, right? Now, because of PCR, you have a, a bunch of them, all right? Now, the problem, as you can see, is that what we call wild type, which is normal, say there was no mutation, a real mutation originally, because of PCR, every process of amplification and effective enter sequencing, you are adding mutations. But hopefully, in PCR, you are adding mutation to only some of the clones, okay? In fact, it depends, and you can understand that from here, right? It depends on where, say, if this is your process of PCR, okay, you are just expanding, you start with one molecule and you create a million of them. The question is, where is the mutation happen? Where is the mistake in PCR? Because PCR, it's, right? In PCR, you are doing cell, it's like doing cell division, right? You're taking your DNA and you are opening it and you are duplicating it. But duplication, like cell division, every time you copy DNA, you can accumulate mistakes. So then the question is, when is this mistake occurring? Well, if that mistake occurs in the first division due to PCR, in the first, first cycle, then 50% of the population will have that error. And it's not real. And actually, those are the worst because it looks really real, right? It's 50% of the population has it. Um, so anyway, so, and of course, in the, in the ideal scenario, when it's real, 100% of the fragments have it for that UID, okay? But you see now why we want to keep track of the, of we put labels because now I can distinguish this group of this set of fragments from this set and so on, okay? <clears throat> and so, um, what we do is we look at, after doing PCR, we sequence and we look at what is called mutant allele frequency or AMF. And what that is, the mutant allele frequency is, how many mutations I observe out of all, basically the fragments that I read in the family, okay? And given that, then I can build a distribution. So here I get to answer your question, which is now I do this process. So the, the, what I showed you before was data from TCGA, so that's cancer data. Now, in our study, we took blood samples from healthy individuals, apparently healthy individuals, with possibly some of those drivers, certainly with some of those drivers, and cancer patients. And so now we do this process of PCR and sequencing for all of them. And now we observe the AMFs, this metanally frequencies, in healthy individuals, for every mutation and in cancer individuals for every mutation. So now we have two distributions. So now we have healthy individuals that have a driver mutation, which will show up in our sequencing. So that becomes normal, right? So we observe some healthy individuals that have a particular TP53 mutation or KRAS mutation. So now we have distributions for how large those frequencies are because think about in a healthy individual you may have a KRAS mutation but unless a very large clone it may be a very small signal right so when I look at those frequencies that I just show you these MAFs I would expect that only a few UIDs have it right because out of all the blood that I analyze there is this little now, if instead I have a large tumor where a particular mutation is present in all of it, say, and a lot of this gets shed in the blood, I should observe a much larger frequency. So MAF should be much higher, right? 
So imagine these two distribution. I don't have a plot of the two distribution, but imagine two distributions with some separation, right? So what I can do is just like log likelihood ratio. Um, here is weighted by four because we did this in four wells. So we repeated the experiment four times just to be more robust, okay? And this was the score, this was it. You know, here P is essentially, you can, is the P value, is the probability to observe, uh, let, me, let me say here. Here P of N is the probability to observe that frequency or higher in the normal population. And P of C, is the probability to observe that frequency for that mutation in the cancer population. So you consider that, this is standard statistics. You know, if you don't remember, just look at the log likelihood ratio. And, and we just weighted it. Okay, so that's what I call the omega score. Someone asked me, why did you call it omega score? I don't know. I just picked the Greek letter and ended up in omega. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that part. And then, and then on the other side, we were looking at protein levels. And so through, through a process that I, I, I won't explain other because of time, but essentially we selected um, uh, you know, this uh, nine proteins that you see here and um, actually eight. So I'm looking at, there is one here that I guess was dropped afterwards, but, um, and so we use, and so, and then we just use logistic regression. So as you can see, we select the proteins where cancer patients, the signal for cancer patient, which is the red, was generally much higher than for healthy individuals, okay? Now I'll tell you something where people like you can have a contribution in the medical field, because as I told you, you know, historically in the medical field and, and doctors are historically used to this, people doing quantitative stuff are of service to them, you know, doing a power calculation for them or some whatever analysis, okay? Today, because the data are becoming so complicated, actually often you inform the methodology, okay? So if we have the proteins in this paper is because at some point I said, guys, the signal is very strong also from proteins, why not adding it? What was the problem of initially the doctors with the proteins? It was that when they were looking at these figures, uh, I think these are called waterfalls, right? Plots. Um, they were like, look, there is not enough separation. There are, for example, for OPN, this protein here, right? There are some patients, I don't know if you can see, there is some blue even here, very close to the top, you know, uh, uh, on, the, on the lower level uh, here on the x-axis. So close to zero. Do you see how high these patients are here? And these are normal. Sorry, they're not patients, they are normal. So they were saying, I, I cannot include this protein because there are healthy individuals that have, a, have a pretty high. So there's not a good protein. But the point is that mathematically, you can understand that, look at the figure. There is definitely some separation, some degree of, pref of separation, right? Red is definitely more present here than here. So guess what? If I put enough of these proteins together, even though this one on its own, yes, wouldn't be very good to make the call by itself, once you combine the information that comes from this protein and this protein and this protein, now you can separate things actually quite well. And by the way, it, was very it is very important in early detection to focus on very high specificity. And for specificity, right? We want to have a very low false positive rate. We don't want to tell people they have cancer when they don't. So to give you a sense of the game we are playing, we are playing at around 99% specificity, okay? Anything below that is considered not really acceptable for future test methodologies. Maybe 98, but we are there. So that was their concern, right? So here is a mathematician that says to the clinician, actually, this is very good, and I'll show you how we can do this. And then they were convinced, and this became the test. <clears throat> and the performance was pretty good, I would say. 
Of course, it was a function of stage. So stage one are the hardest to find because they are the smallest and they shed less DNA in the blood, right? Stage two and three was much higher. But look at the performance. I mean, sure, it's not perfect. For example, in breast, it's you know less than 50%. It's about 40%. But when you look across the this A cancer types that we analyzed, um, you know, if, even if it's not perfect, if you did this test, say, once a year, maybe you don't catch it this year, you'll catch it the next year, okay? But especially, if, look at this first five cancer, ovary, liver, stomach, pancreas, and esophagus. There is no screening today. Today. I have a friend mathematician that on July 2nd was detected with liver cancer stage four, passed away on July 24th, okay? This is like, we are in 2022. This is unacceptable, okay? So no screening whatsoever. And here there are technologies that actually can do a pretty good job of finding these cancers. Now, this is a case control study. It's not a prospective study, right? So the performance in a prospective study uh, where the prevalence of cancer is very, very small, right? Less than 1% of the people of a given age will have cancer, not knowing it. So you have to take all of that into account, but, but this is very exciting, I think, okay? Uh, maybe just let me say, uh, just to give you a sense of how uh, I have one more small topic and then we are done, but let me just say that this technology, um, so this was in my disclosure, so if this becomes a test at some point, I have some royalties on it, but uh, the company, I wasn't part of the company and it was built uh, at Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins sold this thing, this company, the you know, startup for two billions. Okay, this is how, this is the value of, of this type of stuff today. Two billions. Um, okay, uh, the last thing I wanted to show you is how you can use this same type of approaches for monitoring patients after surgery. So in this case, uh, this was published uh, in June uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, it was in colorectal cancer patients. Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a, a great question. So right now those tests are about $1,000. There is one available, uh, not this one, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's called Gallery. You can buy it, it's $949 in the United States. And it works pretty well. If you have the money, I recommend it. But um, obviously at that cost, health insurance is definitely in the United States they will not pay. So a lot of, my work is how to make that, you know, two hundred dollars, and uh, I think we are doing it. We actually are in the last month or two of finalizing exactly what you asked, and and what I believe is that when these blood tests are hundred two hundred dollars, now you have something that a person may decide to pay instead of going, you know, two three four times to the restaurant to even even if health insurances are not paying. And I think health insurances will end up paying if, if that's the cost. And, and we are, you know, I'm in the planning of a 100,000 uh, people study to test this blood test on, on them. And if it works, it's going to be a three-year study, but if it works, it's, uh, it's going to be very exciting. I, I, think, I think we'll be successful. So, <clears throat> yeah, so here, uh, I'll tell you this, this is funny. So here the question is, these patients have colorectal cancer, detect it early. And then the question is, do they need chemotherapy? Is there cancer left? Surgeons leave margins around, uh, sorry, cut margins around the cancer just to be safe, right? But not even a surgeon, you know, you don't, you don't see the cancer. They don't come with flags, right? You can kind of see where the cancerous tissue is. And that's, that tells you how good a surgeon is. But, you know, 
it's it's a very imprecise thing. So um, the question is, can we use the blood test? So let's sequence the cancer of the patient. Let's see what mutations that patient's cancer has. Can we find those mutations in the blood after a few weeks? And if we do, then that patient should definitely go under chemotherapy. And if he doesn't, if she doesn't, then that person has spare chemotherapy. And what we show in this study is that using this technique, half of the patients were spare chemotherapy. So half of the patients that would have gotten chemotherapy didn't have to. And you know, this is both um, from a medical, from a physical point of view, great news for the patient. From a financial point of view, it's great news, right? Um, so, um, and again, what we did there is something where we use a digital approach, which means that I told you that we did the experiments in four wells. Well, here we wanted to be even more sensitive. So we did it on a 96 wells plate of which 95 wells contained samples from the patient and one was control. And um, again, we just uh, approach and here. I'll just tell you the general principle uh, because of time, but, but you can find all the details in, in the paper that's, that's there. You know, so essentially for every mutation and for every sample, we look at the MAF of that well and we score them with the same type of idea, right? So how probable is this in a normal individual, okay? versus what we observe in that patient. And then, but we have here now 96 wells or 95. So now we want to combine the information coming from each one of these 95 wells, okay? To be more powerful in what we see. Instead of four wells, it's, it's 96. And then, because a patient usually in a cancer has more than one mutation, we do this not just for one mutation, but for all the mutations that that patient had. You know, so it could be two, three, four mutations, okay? So then you combine all of these scores into one final score, okay? And um, let me just say that, uh, as I said, uh, through this, um, uh, in fact, I, I forgot to have this, let me, maybe from this paper, from the, here we go. This is the paper on the right. But if you look at here, this was the preliminary study that allow us to do then this, this randomized clinical trial. Here, what you can see is the separation between patients that, so these were all patients having the same surgery with, this, with the surgeons convinced to have removed everything, right? But thanks to the blood test, after four to seven weeks, we could tell with a pretty good degree of separation those that were going to recur from those that were not, okay? And that's how we spare chemotherapy to half of the patients. And actually, and I'll conclude with this, you know, this is the day was, I think it was in 2016, 17, day I realized that what I was doing was actually having an effect on patients because what happened one day is my medical colleague calls me, Dr. Vogelstein calls me in his office. You know, I, I was producing this course, right? And so the way it works is, this was a study done in Australia, uh, about 10 cancer centers in Australia, or 12, and us at Hopkins on the sequencing and algorithmic side. So what happened is the patient would undergo surgery, we would take this, they would take the sample of their cancer, fly it to Hopkins, we will get it, sequence it, analyze it, I will provide a score, send them back the score, based on, you know, is it high, then that patient will undergo chemotherapy. Is a law that patient doesn't need chemotherapy. So one day, Vogelstein calls me in his office and says, Christian, for this patient, you gave me a score that's kind of an in between. And I look at him kind of like, yeah, welcome to reality. I mean, sometimes, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's just not clear. Okay. And so he says, okay, I understand, but so what should we do? And I said, well, if you were me to you know, err on the side of being cautious, I would say, put the patient under chemotherapy. 
and to Augustine replies, well, okay, then you have heard what Dr. Tomazetti said, and I'm looking around like, you know, who is he talking to? And I guess we were on speakerphone, and there was the Australian doctor on the line, and he says, okay, I'm going to go to the next room to tell the patient that we start chemotherapy, okay? And that day, <laughs> I kind of freaked out a little bit because I really felt, uh, you know, at a very personal level that what we were doing was literally having an impact, you know, like, a few hours later for in the life of a person so it's a very serious uh, thing you know this is not a joke um it's just an, it's not just a theoretical game but on the other side i think this is what is exciting about this field right that that we can really have a major impact um in the life of people so i'll i'll stop here i'll thank you uh, a reminder that uh, if if what you saw here um what you saw here was uh, of interest to you or you were interested in considering um, or even exploring uh, working with me and my group, uh, just send me an email. Uh, if with a picture, even better, so that I can remember, I'll, I'll probably remember your face. And uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. Questions? So, so then, thank you again very much. Thank you. Uh, oh, there is ah, there is question. an online question. Um, Can the blood test for cancer detection be used globally? Uh, yes, the in in principle, of course, there is uh, no difference. Um, I'll mention two things. The first one is. Of course, especially for developing countries, as you can imagine, uh, you know, the more expensive, the less probable that the test will be used. So that's one reason why it's so important to me to try to take the cost of this test as low as possible. Uh, also, uh, unfortunately, you know, there is a lot of bias, uh, even in terms of race, for what has been sequenced until today. And so TCGA, it's uh, you know ninety five percent or so Caucasian, and uh, one of the goals of the study, for example, that we are about to start, is to have uh, representation of Asian and you know African American and Africans and Hispanic and, and all of that, uh, because what is normal in maybe slightly different in different. Uh, you know, ethnicities and races. And this is another question. Oh. Uh, can it detect to which organ the cancer is localized and with what precision? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, the answer is, yeah, you can. In fact, that paper I show you, Cancer Seek, we were the first one to do it. And we use random forest, putting everything together to, you know, uh, the combination of proteins and which mutations were giving us, um, I don't remember if it was about 80% accuracy uh, in, in picking the top two tissues from which it, it could have come. So yes, and uh, the other test I mentioned, a competitor by Grail, the one that's on sale already right now, does that. And in fact, it, you know, it's a, it's a newer test, so it does that better. Uh, I would say there are some major pros and also some very important cons in that approach because um, I've heard that and I, I expected this to happen that you know if you, if you tell a person uh, it looks like you have a colorectal cancer um, uh, you may end up doing more exams when it's a false positive and there are lots of false positives uh, you know, say the pre positive predictive value of this test may be something like 20, 30 percent. OK, so this means that seven out of 10 times the result is a false positive. And it's still good. That's great. I, I hope for something like that. But so you deal with 70 percent of people that doesn't really have it. And now these people go and do something to check the column. Then they don't find it. Then what? So, you know, what, what am I going to do? You guys told me it was in my column. Well, maybe we're wrong. Now do a CT scan to check the other organs. And then maybe the CT scan shows nothing, you know? And then this person is going to stress out for the rest of their life about their colon 
and it probably was really nothing, right? So since at the end of the day to detect the cancer, you have to use a CT scan usually, um, I would say, you know, across the board at least, uh, I would say, I, I was, for now, my, my choice is to stick with just whether there is or not, and localization is an, a problem for still to, you know, to be work a lot on before making it uh, applicable uh, in the general population. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that was it. so if there are other questions, then uh, we thank you again. And uh, we have a coffee break up there and then after the post session. Okay, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Grazie. Uh, uh,